Karen Armstrong, it really is a great privilege and honor to, uh, to be able to talk with you uh, about this. Um, let's begin with the, with the big idea, uh, compassion, the charter of compassion. Could you describe that yes. for us? Yes. Um, in 2008, I won the TED Prize, and they give you a wish for a better world, which they will try and make happen. And for, I, for years, I've been writing about religion. And in whatever, uh, in whatever tradition I'm writing and whatever subject I'm taking up, I kept being brought back to compassion. And then I wrote my book, The Great Transformation, uh, about the genesis of many of what we call the world religions. And mm -hmm. every single one of them had at its core what's often called the golden rule, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. But it seemed to me frustrating that our main goal, one of the main tasks of our, of our generation is to build a global community where people of all persuasions can live together in harmony and respect. And the religions with this ethic should mm -hmm. be making a major contribution. Mm -hmm. And yet they're often seen as part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So I asked Ted to help me to create, craft, propagate and launch a charter for compassion uh, ju ju to recall religion away from all the doctrines and the peripheral things back to this uh, so that we could address uh, this, uh, th th these, these severe problems in our time. And I've been astonished. We, we launched it and we really thought that was going to be the end of it. We'd made a sort of stand or a demonstration. Uh, it, was, it had been written by leading activists in six major world faiths. And we launched it uh, in 2009, and then people started to take it up. And it will be of interest to you all here that the people who've come forward to help me most have been businessmen. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, that is something that I could never have foreseen. I mean, I have the business head of a chicken. <laughs> I, um, and there's, there's no way I thought that this could have imagined this. But it's wonderful for me because I'm an ideas person. Uh, but businessmen know how to plan and strategically implement and create realistic uh, things. So businessmen in uh, uh, the Middle East, in Pakistan, which has become virtually the leader of the charter, which has been an amazing thing, uh, fr right from the front line of our, of our polarized world. The, there are many things in what you've said that I think raise interesting questions. I know that you are very, very serious about this. Mm. This is, so how does one, undoubtedly there are going to be people who are saying and thinking, this is all really wonderful. Of course we should believe in the golden rule. And of course everybody should come together and love each other and, and so on. But it means more than that to you. So how can you convey this sense that this is very serious and it has to be integrated into the lives of people, not just something that we all ascribe to, but then go about our daily lives. Yes, I mean, people often say to me, well, you're just <coughs> preaching to the converted, or as the Americans say, you're preaching to the choir. Yeah. You know, you're just talking to people who are stuck in church anyway. And I say I'm perfectly happy to preach to the choir because the choir isn't singing. Yeah. If all the people... <laughs> If all the people who believe in the golden rule or, and who tell me that, you know, oh, of course we all agree with compassion, actually got active, we could turn a around all this discourse mm -hmm. of hate uh, and uh, religious discourse of hate. We could, we, could, we could change the conversation. But we've got to get active and practical. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, and it, I think part of the word mm -hmm. trouble is the uh, word compassion, which mm -hmm. has got so feeble, enfeebled that it's dropped out of our lexicon and people mm -hmm. think it means pity. Mm -hmm. When I was giving a speech in, in, uh, in um, Holland, I specifically said that compassion does not mean feeling sorry for people. And yet every time I mention compassion in the Dutch translation of my text in the newspaper, they translated it pity. Yeah. It's ingrained. Uh, compassion is, it means different things. In uh, the uh, Buddhist tradition, uh, it means uh, to take responsibility for the pain that you see in the world. We all see pain all around us. We're subjected to images of pain as perhaps no previous generation with our modern media 
One of the things that's striking about what you write is this several centuries period, the Axial Age, in which people became so fed up with violence, but they were also able to develop lives in which they could reflect on what is a good life, what is a meaningful life. And one of the things we see today is hundreds of millions of people coming into that state who were not in that state before. So I guess the question I'm, I, I want you to, to sort of speak to is, do you sense this yearning? Mm. Where is it coming from? How does it relate to what's happening in today's world? I think people look around and see the violence. Mm -hmm. They see the hatred. They, people know that something isn't working. It is simply not sustainable. No. The sages of the so-called Axial Age, that's Confucius, the Buddha, Socrates, the Greek tragedians, they were all living in times like our own, uh, which were full of violence, where violence had somehow reached a crescendo. Mm -hmm. And it was that that made them implement mm -hmm. the golden rule. They said, if, as one of the Chinese sages said, if we go on like this, we will destroy one another. That is even more so today with our weaponry. Would you also add in to this the existence of incredible new interconnectedness in media so that we're able to see pain and suffering in ways that we had not been able to see before? Because you're very, mm -hmm. very astutely interested in the observation of pain and what that opens up and suffering, what that opens up in human beings. Pain is something we all have. Mm -hmm. And pain is therefore something that can bring us all together. We so often shut ourselves off in our pain and we've got to look tough and we've got this wretched thing in the West about being positive, you mm -hmm. know, uh, sort of always looking on the bright side of life and, uh, and God forbid you should say you're feeling miserable, but let people in. Do people like you at parties? <laughs> I see they're just about to come up with some really juicy bit of gossip yeah. and they catch sight of me and their faces fall. Yeah. Uh, I feel a bit like a party pooper. So. Yeah. But nevertheless, the pain mm -hmm. is there and if we, sometimes we say, oh, this is nothing to do with us, but if we uh, deny our own pain if it's, and say everything is fine, and uh, we th it's very easy to dismiss the pain of other people. And so we've got to find out more about one another, too. We're talking about dialogue so often, as though uh, if the whole world started engaging in dialogue, peace would break out. Yeah. But there's very little Socratic dialogue going on. Yeah. I it's often that, dialogue means simply bludgeoning the other side to accept our opinion. Yeah. So uh, how do you think we should, as cultures, as societies, as universities, as institutions, try to overcome that? Well, media, I think, mm -hmm. plays a big role. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I think the media has, has a job to go a little more deeply into these, uh, instead of the soundbite, to, to help us penetrate these areas. Educators have that responsibility mm -hmm. too. Parents, mm -hmm. uh, re pre teachers, mm -hmm. uh, because we can't understand one another mm -hmm. unless we know uh, that person's story. Mm -hmm. There are two ways in which people, I think, can respond in, in sort of diametrically opposed ways. One is, we all know what you're already saying, we all believe in the golden rule, we just have to do it more. We Thank you very much for pointing that out, but you know, we have. the other side is, boy, you're asking a lot of us. Human nature just can't go that far. You're asking us to love our enemy, to forgive people who have done things. These are serious things that people have done. What do you say to that side? Um, first of all, look into your own heart and discover the wickedness in there. I've had such a privileged life uh, that uh, goodness knows what I would have been like if I'd been born two or three hundred years ago and yeah. hadn't had an education. I'd been one of those angry witches, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, so think of that. Think of what you could, you could be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that is a part of it. And love. I, I'm wary of using the word love in this context here because I think in English we've debased the word so much. It's a principal determination to uh, look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain, 
and then refuse to inflict that pain on anyone else. If we want a peaceful world, we have to be more compassionate. And, and, and is it also right to say that these are very, very difficult things yes. to achieve? It is hard. That's why I call my book 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, uh, based on the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, program, because we are addicted to our pet hates. We often don't know what we do without them. They're essential to our sense of self, both on a national level, uh, a cultural level, as well as an individual level. Uh, so we need to be weaned away from them, step by step, little by little, to train ourselves. We can train our minds. But if we can, at the end of our lives, perhaps say, as we die, well, perhaps the world is just a little bit better because I've lived in it. Yes then in, in that case, our lives will have been uh, worthwhile. But, uh, yes. and, and it is liberating. Yes. It is liberating to let go of this sense of righteousness and privilege and to, to say that only I suffer, to let other people's pain come in. So it, it is a fulfilling... It's a growing It's a growing capacity. thing. You begin to discover new capacities within yourself, even, uh, even quite early. Yes in the process. Shifting just a bit, I think it's natural to wonder whether a free market life, uh, a consumer, producer, capitalistic life, is consistent with what you advocate, whether it can be integrated into it uh, in a material culture that people what well, do you think about that? as I say, I'm the wrong person to ask about this because yeah. of my utter inability in econ to understand things economic. But, and I'm not proud of that, I'm not, not saying that in the way that people say when they're really delighted that they can't understand. I, I feel really stupid on these occasions. But, um, these people who've come forward to help me, one of their main objectives is to make compassion effective in business. Um, and business could be, I mean, as such a powerful tool. It is very powerful. Um, for bringing uh, light and help into the world. Yeah. Uh, to, to bringing help, not just hogging wealth for ourselves, but taking it to where, it, sometimes from our great abundance to where it may be needed. Let's close on the, the <coughs> fundamental point that you have made now for many years which is the commonness of the religious groups within the world and deep philosophical traditions. Could you just say something about that, the commonality that's so important? Well, um, they, I, the world religions are not all the same. Yeah. Uh, they have significant and wonderful differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because the religions are are, are, are talking about transcendence, mm -hmm. that is inevitable because none of us has the last word. The, the, the search to find not definitive answers, that's a modern heresy, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, but to find, uh, um, to attempt to, to find ways of living with problems for which there are no easy solutions, like pain and cruelty and injustice and death and suffering uh, and to help us live with those realities kindly, mm -hmm. creatively and peacefully uh, and at peace with our fellow human beings and with all creatures on our planet. Do you think, um, yes or no, do you think <laughs> it's possible we are in a new axial age <laughs> uh, we certainly are living in an axial, mm -hmm. um, uh, but our, um, our sages have not been Buddha, mm -hmm. they've been Einstein, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Gates, mm -hmm. uh, th it's been a technological uh, axial mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. But um, it, this axial ages don't just come about, they come about because people work for it. We can ha make an axial age if we work at it. Karen Armstrong, thank you very much. Thank you.